we just lift those who need a touch from you, Christina and Jerry and George and others. Mm -hmm. Father, we know that there's healing in your hands. Mm -hmm. We know that the report that we believe, according to Isaiah 53, is the report of the Lord. And Father, I just thank you that healing is available through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I also pray that you would bless me with, with health, Lord. Um, I'm going to see my doctors Monday morning at 7 o'clock. I don't know why they'd make an appointment at 7 o'clock, but I guess I'm special. <laughs> but anyways, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, Lord, we just pray that everyone who needs a touch, a physical touch from you, that you would meet them at their place of need, and that you would bless them, that you would help them, that you would bring restoration and wholeness to them. We praise you for the word that's going to go forth this morning, Lord. Bless it. Let us settle our hearts and minds so that each of us would re receive from heaven the download that you have for each of us that you would bless us and help us and give us instruction, not just so we have information in our minds, but that the words that are written in this holy book would lead to transformation in our lives. We praise you and thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, it's interesting how at times in life, there's just interesting people that come across our paths. And um, one of those... Uh, people is um, the lady who used to be our church administrator. She passed away a little over a year ago, Jan. And um, it was funny because this message this morning, uh, uh, a community in unity, you know, Jan had to have it her way. <laughs> and uh, it was Jan's way or no way. And she was just a sweet lady, but, you know, she didn't like to, um, to, to really bend a lot. But, you know, Jan endured a lot of things here. Um, she was here from the first day the church started, and so she used to say, I'm, I have seniority over you, pastors, so you have to listen to me. And, um, you know, she, uh, she was just uh, really sweet in, in a lot of ways. But, you know, she caused a lot of good things to happen, and she was faithful, and, you know, she um, just continued to, to, to bring people together, and uh, she had a great recollection of people's names and she could call out people by name, even if it was, you know, a lot of time had elapsed between the time we see them. And, you know, um, because of Jan, I think there was a lot of unity in our church. And it was there was a couple times when Jan says, you know, I, I don't think I should even be part of this church with the previous um, pastors that were here. You know, Jan always felt that she wasn't inside the inside group, and that kind of bothered her from time to time. And she's like, you know, I'd like to leave the church, but God hasn't told me I should, so I have to stay. <laughs> you know, it was just kind of funny because, you know, most people, they think church is just a revolving door. They come and go and you have no clue. But, you know, Jan knew that God had sent her here. And um, she's like, in my mind, I'd like to go, but, you know, God didn't tell me to go, so I have to stay. She was just really cute. And so... In speaking about unity, I just wanted to tell you, I think Jan, you know, she just did a lot to, um, to bring unity and, and closeness. And um, there was another gentleman um, in my life. His name was Dwayne. Dwayne belonged to another church, but we were close friends. Actually, Dwayne introduced Sue and I together years ago. Because when I was doing the food ministry by myself, um, Dwayne said, well, Sue has food and you need food, so... You two need to get together. And then, um, you know, one day, um, I don't know, even what, remember what the issue was, but um, Sue called up Dwayne and said, you know, something about me. And so Dwayne came rushing over to her office and said, I'll pray for you, because Sue said, you know, I want a divorce from Curtis. You know, he's taking all my food to South Warren, and I don't even under remember what the issue was, but it was just kind of funny. But Dwayne was that kind of guy who, brought people together no matter what. There was another fr a mutual friend that we had. and um, <clears throat> This guy, you know, he, um, he just was out there sometimes. And um, Dwayne realized that there was a lot of friction between us. So what did Dwayne do? He invited us both to breakfast <laughs> together. And uh, this other guy, <laughs> he didn't want to see me. He didn't want to 
deal with any friction. And um, Dwayne used to say, well, faster you got to understand one thing. You know, if there's um, friction in a relationship, mm -hmm. there's no innocent party. You know, one party might be 80% responsible for the problems and the other 20%. Mm -hmm. It might be 99% and 1%. And he said, I don't see what you did wrong, but, you know, you're still part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So he brought us together. It didn't work as well as Dwayne had expected, but he was always trying to connect people, always trying to bring people together, always putting God first. And to me, it was just amazing because, um, you know, Dwayne, for 25 years, Dwayne passed away the same month Jan did, um, a year ago, November. And Dwayne, for 25 years, sent me a scripture and a prayer every single morning, seven days a week, for 25 consecutive years. Never missed. Um, and, um, I mean, he had an amazing track record. He just brought people together. And, you know, Dwayne realized that our common unity was in Christ. And he wanted to keep people close. And he wanted to bring people together. Mm -hmm. I remember one time Dwayne attended um, a, a Lutheran church because his wife was Lutheran. And Dwayne's like, I don't know why I'm in a Lutheran church, but I have to have peace in my house. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it's a good church. And um, one time they had a, 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 a water pipe burst in their church. And so Dwayne called me up and he says, this is an all hands on deck situation. If you got to come over here and help us. So I said, okay, I'll come. So I, I went over there, and one of their um, elders on their elder board, um, he said, well, that's the pastor from a church that's not Lutheran. <laughs> and what's he here for? And he said, you know, Dwayne says, I called him. It's all hands on deck. We're all brothers in Christ. And he's like, but he's not Lutheran. <laughs> and... Um, you know, Dwayne kind of, and this was a guy that was on the elder board of the church, not just a, a member of the church. Dwayne had no problem hitting people with a sledgehammer. Uh -oh. And, uh, you know, this guy begrudgingly had to work side by side with me all day long, even though he didn't think that I should be there because, you know, I, I'm, I'm of a different uh, denomination. So Dwayne was one of those guys that he realized that our common unity was in Christ. And our, our unity in Christ is what brought us together. And so that's one of the things I most appreciate about a lot of the people in my life. You know, um, Jan and, and Dwayne, they were all in for Christ, and they were all in for the kingdom. And they used those platforms. And uh, now they're in heaven. They're both in heaven. And, uh, you know, uh, hopefully enjoying the rewards of a life well lived. Well, last weekend, I challenged you to be bold and not to fold when times get tough because times are going to get tough. Times are going to get tougher. Um, here in Michigan, they just passed the uh, expansion of the Elliott Larson Act um, this past week. And, um, you know, it expands protections for um, all kinds of additional things. And so when we speak of biblical truth, whether you stand on no matter what side you stand on the LGBTQ, LMNOP um, thing. Um, I don't know, but they keep adding letters to it, and I've lost track of them all, so I, I'm not being funny. I'm just saying what it is. But, you know, when the state is going to dictate what churches can preach, even if it's Bible truth, you know, there, there might be a problem coming down the road, and it's probably going to be litigated at some point in time. It could even become criminal. It already is that way in Canada. When you speak Bible truth about um, the way God looks at marriage as being one man and one woman, if you speak anything uh, uh, but everything is okay, everything's acceptable no matter who it is. And, uh, you know, when you say that the only, the only position I have is the biblical position, um, pastors in Canada have been arrested for that. And so it's coming to America. Don't be surprised. Um, those those same things are here. They're they're slowly pushing more and more laws to make everything, you know, acceptable. And uh, it's not. You know, the Bible says in the last days they'll call evil good and good evil. And here we are. But that's not why I want to talk uh, about this morning. You know, last week I told you I 
I spoke on how to be bold and not to fold when tough times come, how to be proactive, how to be prayerful, how to be prepared. But today we're finishing up, as I said, the, the fourth chapter of Acts. And what I want to do is we win, we, we win when we're all in. And um, that's the, the, the reason I gave you the illustration of both Jan and Dwayne, because they were believers who were all in. I mean, no matter what, even when people came against them, they didn't just say, oh, I'm sorry, and I apologize. You know, when they knew something was right, they fought for it. They stood up for it. And, um, you know, we all win when we're all in. So today we're going to look at the last few verses from the, the book of Acts chapter 4. And uh, specifically, we're going to look at verses 32 through 37. And this is just a brief snapshot summary of how the early church functioned. I'm going to read this text to you. It's not a lot of text to read, but um, you know this will be the framework for my message this morning. Beginning at verse 32, Acts chapter 4, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. How amazing would that be? That we would live in a place where no one had need because everybody enjoyed everything in common and um, that there wasn't anybody that had anything that they thought was their own because they believed that everything came from God and it belongs to God. Amen. These first followers actually demonstrated three traits that have direct application to each of us this morning. We're called to exhibit oneness. We're called to extend ourselves. And we're called to encourage others. You might say, well, what does all that mean in terms of myself? Well, look at verse 32. It says, Now the number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. The full number means there was a great multitude. The word believe here reminds us that oneness, that we have, what we have is because of what we've believed. And to believe means to be firmly persuaded, to rely on, to trust in something. That's what the belief here in this text literally means. And if you have not yet believed in Jesus Christ through the new birth, then you don't really belong to God's church, to His church. See, only if you're born again do you belong to the universal church. And we'd love for you to belong to this church, but it's your choice. There's no way you can force somebody to do something. You might be able to strongly suggest something for a short period of time, but unless somebody does it on their own will, it won't last. There's an old saying that says, a man persuaded against his will is still amongst the same and still. See, you can persuade somebody for a short period of time. They might follow or do something for a short period of time. But unless it's in their heart and mind to do it of their own accord, they're not going to do something against their will for very long. So when we come to Christ... It's not that somebody puts pressure on you. I mean, maybe when you were a kid, you had to go to church. It's probably not that way with most parents. But my mom, I mean, when it came to going to church or going to school, 
There was two ways to get out of it. My mom said you had to be in the hospital with a wristband or you had to be in the morgue with a toe tag. Otherwise, you're going to school. If you were sick, if you were sniffling, if you had a sore stomach, you didn't feel good, if you had a headache, you're going to school. Because that's where you need to be. My mom didn't take any excuses. And uh, she didn't take any guff either. So that's just the way it was. It was her way or no way. And, um, you know, now I was, I was flabbergasted this week. You know, Thursday when they predicted snow, they call off school before the snow even starts falling. I mean, in my day, the snow had to be up to your rear end before they called off school. And um, that's while you're in school in the middle of the snow and you have to walk home, you know, with snow up to your rear. But um, now we have this little, oh, you know, it's going to snow tomorrow. Let's all cancel school in advance. You know, I mean, who ever heard of such things? And I'm not being disrespectful to teachers, but in the time when I grew up, that just was unheard of. And um, I just kind of snicker about it, but oh well. But back to my message. Notice all those who were born again were bound to each other. You know, this is symptomatic of people who profess faith. I mean, they were bound together. And how were they bound? With one heart, with one soul. A lot of people, they say they're committed to a church. I find it hilarious when I see somebody, you know, at Meyer or at Kroger. Oh, pastor, how you doing? You know, I just love church and love coming there. I haven't seen you in five years. I'm not your pastor. What are you talking about? You know, and you know, these people, they just have ideas in their head that are crazy. I mean, to have one soul and one heart, that means we're hanging together on a regular basis. You see, when it comes to the heart, the heart represents our desires. So when our desires aren't of God, we know that our hearts aren't right. The heart represents the desires that we have as a human. And the soul is the immaterial part of our being. <clears throat> and this has the idea of having harmony in both thoughts and affection in our head and our heart. So when our souls are together, there's harmony in our thinking and affections together. And since they share a common love, they share a common life. See, Christians that share a common love share a common life. Because they believed in one Lord and had one spirit indwelling in each of them, they were with one another. They didn't want to be apart from each other. They realized that gathering together was critical and important. In the book of Hebrews, it says that don't forsake gathering together, as some of you have. There's a Puritan teacher, Thomas Brooks. He was spot on when he wrote this. He said, discord and division become no Christian. For the wolves to worry the lamb is no wonder. But for one lamb to worry another, that is unnatural and monstrous. See, the early church, they exhibited oneness from the very beginning. They were a unified body. In Acts 1.14 it says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. See, you can't pray with somebody else. You can't look somebody else in the eyes and have division with them. See, when you pray with somebody else, that means you're devoted to that somebody else. In Acts 2, 1, it tells us on the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place. See, physically together. You know, some people, well, I'm spiritual, but I don't need the church. Well, God designed the church to be the church, to gather together. Yeah, yeah. You're not following God's ways. In Acts 2.44 it says, And all who believed were together. Amen. I think you kind of get the theme. I could give you more verses, but you know, when you are a believer, you're supposed to be part of the family, part of the group. And this word is the imperfect tense, meaning 
they made it a practice of gathering together all the time, meaning daily. And this goes along with what we've learned last week, the importance of being your people. If you want to be part of your people, you have to gather. It's difficult for us to exhibit oneness when we think, well, I'm better than that one, or I'm better than this one, or, you know, I know there's railroad tracks here at Grospect and over here by Shearwood. You know, you're from that side of the tracks or this side of the tracks or some other tracks. You know, I'm better than you. Max Lucado, the Christian author, he, he's written a number of great books. And he's a pastor as well. He tells of a time when his wife brought home a monkey. She bought it and brought it home. And he didn't like the idea of having a monkey in his house. So he didn't just object, he strongly objected. I don't want this monkey in my house. So he asked his wife, where's this monkey going to eat? And his wife replied, the monkey's going to eat at our table. <laughs> so she thought about, he thought about it a little bit more and said, well, where's this monkey going to sleep? And she said, well, I think the monkey could probably sleep in our bed. And Max complained. Well, what about the odor? And his wife responds, I got used to you. I guess the monkey can too. <laughs> See, unity doesn't begin in examining others. Unity begins in examining our own smelly selves. Unity begins in examining our own smelly sins. See, oftentimes we only want to look at the other person, as is the story of the monkey. If you ever have a chance to read some of Max's stuff, it's great stuff. Yeah. True story, but see, God's heart has always been for harmony and unity. In 2 Chronicles, we can go all the way back to the Old Testament. In 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 12, it says this, The hands of God was also on Judah to give them one heart, to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. In Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, also Old Testament, in Jeremiah 32, 29, it says, I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for their own good and for the good of their children after them. See, there's only one healthy fear in our lives, and that's the fear of the Lord. And here the prophet is saying, I will give them one heart, one way, that they'll only fear the Lord. And that it won't just be good for them, it'll be good for them, and it'll be good for their children after them. What a powerful thought. Following God will be good for you. And it'll be good for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. See, when you operate in unity of heart, when you operate in unity of soul with other believers, you are an answer to the prayer that Jesus found in the Gospel of John, verse 17, 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. See, Jesus and his Father, Father God, they were in perfect harmony. And Jesus is praying here that, I pray that they be one just as you and I are one, Father, and that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. <clears throat> so the big question this morning is, are you exhibiting oneness with other believers? Do you believe in oneness? Are you operating in oneness? Do you create unity or do you create division? You know, some people, I swear, they have a pot at home and a pot in their car or a pot on their bicycle strapped on the back of their bike because they love stirring the pot. You know, they love just keeping things, you know, division and discord and problems. You know, they just love it. You know, there's 
husband and wives that do this. You know, they have the pot going all the time at home. Instead of unity, instead of harmony, instead of oneness. No, there's always discord. So, are you the one who wants to live in one accord, or are you the one that spreads constant discord? Is there any one of you that need to forgive or ask for forgiveness from someone? See, in Psalm 133, verse 1, it says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. You know, God isn't a God of division. You might think, well, I don't like that person at all. And so they, you know, I feel so bad when you hear these stories about people that go to court. You know, I hope he goes to prison for life and he rots in jail. It's like, I got news for you. That's not going to destroy him. That's going to destroy you. Because the container, the vessel that holds the unforgiveness is the container that's destroyed. So when you have hatred, when you have unforgiveness, when you have ill feelings towards somebody else, you think you're targeting it towards somebody else. But no, you're in reality destroying yourself because you're the container that holds it. And you're the container that will be destroyed because of it. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. You see, we win when we're all in. The second point that I want to make this morning is that we should extend ourselves. We're called to exhibit oneness. And secondly, we're challenged to live outside of ourselves in order to serve other people. You know, I have to admit, sometimes there are just days when it's rough to go. And uh, yesterday was one of those kind of days. And then yesterday I decided, well, in light of, you know, the five surgeries that I had in eight weeks, just a month ago or so, you know, something doesn't seem right. I better go to the hospital and get checked out because I just wasn't up to par. Something was seriously wrong. It wasn't anything serious. And now I have to go see the doctor tomorrow morning at 7. But, you know, sometimes, you know, we just have to, we just have to check ourselves. Because sometimes we just ignore things and it doesn't get better. It gets worse. You know, but, you know, how do we live in the way that God has asked us to live? See, we're to extend ourselves really in two directions. We're to extend ourselves to the lost, and we're to extend ourselves to the found. Well, you might say, well, what the heck does that mean? Well, first, we give the gospel to the lost. We see this in our text this morning in verse 33, and it says, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, And great grace was upon them all. Let me ask you a question. When you enter into a situation, do you bring division and problems and craziness? Or do you bring great grace? It might be the message you're speaking because it says that their testimony was about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was great grace. That was upon them all because the message was one of the Lord and the testimony was, the essence was Jesus. See, the word great here is used twice in the same verse. I don't know if you caught that or not. But it's the Greek word that means megas, M-E-G-A-S, which means at the highest level. It's a superlative. It's an impressive word. We have the apostles who gave testimony about the resurrection, which was so offensive to the religious leaders of that time. But they experienced great power because they spoke of the power of the resurrection. We're in resurrection season. Easter's right around the corner. You know, are we preparing for that? Or are we just ho-hum, just dealing with our ho-hum? You know, the word giving in this text is... Also, an an interesting word, it's the idea of paying back a debt. 
See, because they all had experienced, they were committed to give back to God by giving to the gospel for the lost. This is similar to what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 1.16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. See, we're to witness the power of God because we have the provision of the grace of God. That's our provision. Some people think, well, this is that food, this church, that's a food pantry. You know, maybe the food pantry seems like the overwhelming part of our church, but it's actually the least important of what we do. Sure, we provide thousands and thousands of pounds of food to thousands of people every month. I mean, in January, we gave food to 5,377 people out of this little church. Wow! The city tells us, this building's too small to do what you do. So I tell the city inspectors, well, you come when we're giving out food, and you tell me which people should get food and which ones shouldn't. <laughs> and then they stop questioning me on that point. Maybe they'll come back with a better strategy. I don't know. But anyways, you know, we have the provision of the grace of God. We should be exhibiting the grace of God in our communication, in our actions, in our lifestyle. The giving of the gospel with the great power that's associated with it resulted in great grace being upon them all. And so it should be with us. In the Gospel of John, verse 116, it says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. See, we don't just receive grace. We receive grace upon grace upon grace. We receive grace we don't even deserve. When people ask me, Pastor, how are you doing? It's like, better than I deserve. <laughs> I often say that because I have more blessings than I deserve, but I'm faithful, so God knows I'm faithful. So people look at me and say, how did you get so blessed? Well, when you're faithful, you get blessed. I can't tell you how it works. We'll figure it out when we get to heaven. I'm just telling you how it works. And I like how one translation renders Philemon 6. Philemon is a book that only has one chapter, so there's no chapter and verse. It's just a verse. It says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. See, as we share our faith, our understanding of Him increases, of every good thing we have in Christ. Amen. See, we, we give the gospel to other people, and then we understand more deeply the goodness of God. We understand more deeply the grace that God has given to us. The next point that I want to make um, is we give our goods to be found. Look at verses 34 and 35. It says, There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. You know, we live in America. Everybody thinks, well, you know, I'm going to get that government check. The government's going to take care of me. You know what? It's so The government check's not a bad thing. But the government check was never designed from a biblical perspective. It was never up to the government to support people. It was the church's responsibility. When there was somebody needy, they went to the church, and as there was need, the church would meet that need. But we have it all twisted around in our world. But, you know, the government check, it's crazy because, you know, we think it's wonderful if I could only get that check from the government. Well, you know, like in this community, these houses, they rent for eight, nine hundred bucks, a thousand bucks. And then you find out, well, I finally got that check and it's eight, nine hundred bucks. But then I still have to pay my utilities. I still have to pay my heat. I still have to pay my light bill. I still have... All these other expenses, so I mean, it's only covering part of what I need. 
And so then you're just kind of in bondage because, well, I can't work because then I'll lose it. And if I, well, you know, I already understand how this all works. But it's just interesting what they did. That phrase, they laid it at the apostles' feet. They gave to the apostles to distribute to other people who were in need. That's so foreign to us in America. You know, I've told this many stories about, you know, people just hold on to things so tightly. You know, they wouldn't help somebody else if they had to. You know, and then you realize, well, one day you're not going to be here. You're going to have to let it go anyways. Because even if you die with that money gripped in your hands, the, fun the undertaker will take it out of your hands because he's not going to bury you with it, I promise you. They took what they had. They laid it at the apostles' feet. This is also in the imperfect tense, meaning they didn't do it just once. They did this over and over and over again. They took what they had, they gave it, and laid it at the apostles' feet over and again and again and again. You see, they did something that most people can't do today. They trusted the authority. They trusted the integrity of the apostles to distribute to the people who had need. There was a pastor that points out that these first followers, they demonstrated three things. First of all, they demonstrated servanthood. Everyone placed themselves in the service of others. That's what servanthood is. I'm here, I'm here to serve you. It was funny, there was a time when I thought, well, I want a bigger house, and I want better cars, and I want more of this and more of that. And then after a while, you realize once you have most of those things, it's like I was striving for all this stuff. But it didn't make me any more happy. It didn't satisfy my soul. Of course it's nice to drive a new car, but is it necessary? Not really. And it was funny because, you know... Um, I ended up living in Gross Point for 15 years in the same house. And I thought to myself, you know, someday I'm going to get a bigger house. And it's just like, that's ridiculous. I can't take care of this house. <laughs> you know, I have to pay to have the landscaping done. I have to pay to have the house cleaned. I can't take care of all this myself. So I should get a bigger house so I can pay more to have all this stuff taken care of. Because I can't take care of what I got now myself. So I need to pay more and get more so I could have more and spend more money and not be any more happy. Servanthood. Everyone was placed in the service of others. The second point is selflessness. We live in this myopic world where it's all about me. It's all about me. No, it's not. You know, most people, for them, the Holy Trinity is me, myself, and I. For me, the Holy Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we have to learn to be selfless. Most people think it's all about me. I just want my next fix. I just want my next beer. I just want, I want, I want. Amen. You know, if I could only get the perfect Wait a minute, you're in a relationship, you don't need any perfect side chick or side dude. You don't need anything more. What God has given you is everything that you need. But, you know, we have to be selfless. That's not natural. To be selfless means we place the needs of others ahead of our own greeds. And whether that's your next cigarette, whether that's Whatever. I mean, wait a minute. You might say, well, that's not right. Well, of course it is. If this body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, what are you doing? You know, hello. I mean, we have to learn to be selfless. And then the third point is sacrifice. See, these first century believers, they gave up their precious possessions in order to help those in poverty and need. It's funny because oftentimes I tell people that come to our church, oh, I need that free food. Well, it's not really free. I mean, Cleaner sells food to our church. We buy food. A lot of the food we get, 
is purchased food. Some of it's donated. So it's a mix of both. I'm not saying that there isn't kind people out there that help us out. There's a lot of kind people that help us out. But, you know, there's also fuel. I mean, it was funny. One day this week, I gassed up a, a vehicle of ours every single day. Started with the box truck, 300 bucks. The next day it was the green truck. That was $110. The next day it was another van. That was 90 some dollars. And, you know, I'm thinking for four days in a row, I gassed up one of our vehicles and I've already spent 600 bucks on fluid. I mean, fuel. <laughs> and it's going to get burned up, you know, but it's free to somebody, but it's not free, you know, to haul food and bring it to the church. You have to have a vehicle. You have to put fuel in it. You have to have insurance on that vehicle. There's a lot of things you need. You have to fix it and maintain it. There's a lot of costs. <clears throat> but it was just amazing that in four straight days, you know, I spent 600 bucks. And I was like, wow. And then I tell people when we spend a couple of grand a month on, on fuel to run our food ministry, they're like, there's no way you could spend that kind of money. <laughs> it's like, you need to shadow me for a couple of days, <laughs> you know because you have no understanding of what it really takes to do what we do. But the key to all of this is to fall in love with people. You know, somebody asked me, well, why do you do what you do? I mean, there was a whole bunch of stuff on Facebook this week, a whole bunch of just nasty stuff. You know, people were saying all kinds of nasty things about this, that, or the other, uh, about our church or whatever. And... Um, you know, last week they called me Pastor Judas, which I thought was kind of funny. It's like, how can people behind a keyboard call me Pastor Judas when they don't even know me? And they don't know what we do. The key is to fall in love with people and to fall out of love with stuff. Amen. You know, it was funny because when I was in business, I thought, well, I need a new car every year. Well, your old car doesn't have that many miles, but it's nice to have that new car smell that new car design, drive around a new car every year. So I did that for a number of years, and then I thought to myself, well, I'm no happier in a new car every year than I am with an old car, and this is costing me a lot of money. You know, what are we doing this for? You have to learn to fall in love with people and learn to fall out of love with things. No, it was funny because there was a kid that came to our church a couple months ago. It was right before Christmas. <laughs> and um, his shoes were tattered and worn. So I told him, I'll take you to Meyer and I'll buy you a pair of boots. Well, I don't want to go to Meyer. They don't have the right brand. <laughs> so you'd rather have you'd rather have shoes that the soles falling off of and the other ones worn out. I just told you I would buy you a pair of shoes. You know, I mean, these kids think they need a two hundred dollar pair of tennis shoes. You know, when a $40 pair of tennis shoes is what I wear. It's just as good. They work. I mean, I don't have any fancy $200 tennis shoes. The only reason I spend a lot of money on my shoes is I have a size 16 foot. And sometimes it's hard to find those big sizes. you got to pay extra for them. But that's the only reason I pay money for my shoes. I could care less what the tag on it says. It doesn't have to have that little check mark on it. I don't care. You know, but... When we fall out of love of things, we fall in love with people. Or somebody else said it this way. Pray that your heart is loosened in relationship to things, and it's tightened in its relationship to people. See, persecution often strips us of our materialistic focus because it helps us remember that things don't last, but people do. You know, when it's all said and done, you can bring people with you to heaven, but you ain't bringing any of your stuff. All your stuff, someday, even if you cherish it, will belong to somebody else. Some of us think this is evidence of communism or socialism, you know. They brought what they had and they placed it at the apostles' feet. But it was actually a voluntary response to specific needs. It's not what's yours is mine and I'll take it. But instead, what's mine is yours, and I'll share it. That's kind of what we do here. See, the early church experienced organic oneness. 
It wasn't mandated oneness. It wasn't forced on them. In Acts chapter 5, verse 4, Peter told Ananias he didn't have to sell his property. He said, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? You guys all know the story about Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira. You know, they lied to God about the property that they sold and the amount they sold it to. So Ananias came to church and he brought the money from the sale and lied about it. Well, he dropped dead. And then his wife didn't know that his, her husband dropped dead. So she came to church later that same day and she said the same lie. Floop! I mean, I wish it was that quick nowadays, you know. <laughs> Imagine if you told a lie and you were just gone like that. You know, life would be a lot better for everybody. <laughs> you know, lying's like a national pastime. You know, I'll tell one lie, then I'll tell six more to cover up that first lie, then I'll tell nine more to cover up that lie, and by the time it's all said and done, you've already told 50 lies. It's like, you know, okay, just to cover up your, your garbage. You know, this mutual caring, this mutual commitment to one another, it was just a spontaneous expression of how the Holy Spirit of God led them. It wasn't forced on them. It wasn't the government telling them, sell what you have and bring it to the church and the apostles will distribute it. It was this voluntary thing. You know, because... Um, they just had it in their heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, they were committed to each other. And they contributed to each other to make sure they all had something. But let's look back to Acts 2, 44 and 45. I know we've already covered this in previous lessons, but I just want to go back to this for a second. It says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them amongst all, as they had need. See, the early church was others-centered, not self-centered. See, most of us, like I said, it's me, myself, and I. You know, we walk out of church, and we have Frank Sinatra playing in our head. I'll do it my way. Or we go over to Burger King, and we have it our way. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. Special <laughs> orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us. Have it your way. You know, it's my way or the highway. Some of you aren't old enough to remember that jingle from Burger King, but I do. And um, But that's how we think. You know, even when we say we care about others, that's not how we act. Jesus said you'll be known by your fruit. So to be known by your fruit is your deeds demonstrate what you do. And if your deeds don't indicate what you do, well then you're just... Not there. You're selfish. You know, you either have good fruit on your tree or you have bad fruit on your tree. There's no other fruit. It's either good or bad. It's either godly or evil. And um, it depends on what kind of roots you have and what kind of tree you have. That's a whole nother sermon. You guys ready for a couple more sermons Amen. after this one yeah. today? Yeah. <laughs> See, the early church was other-centered, not self-centered. When they saw that there was somebody in need, they did whatever they could to help that person out. The word divided means that they portioned out thoroughly, that they gave what they had to others. Though selling what they had, they sold their possessions and goods. Through serving those in need, they divided them amongst all as everyone who had need. We also see this in the epistle, 1 John 3, 14. It says, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart for him, how does the love of God abide in him? See, if we see a brother in need and we say, I can't do anything. I mean, legitimately, you might not be able to do anything for him. But if you see somebody in need and you just shut them down, I mean, it says the love of God does not abide in him. See, the first church of Jerusalem valued ministry over money. It's not the American church at all. You know, American churches are businesses by and large. 
But the first church of Jerusalem, ministry was the most important thing they did. Ministry was more important than money. It was people over possessions. Likewise, you and I have been given time. We've been given talents. We've been given treasures. We're to use these things for the good of others and for the glory of God. We're not to love money and use people. We're to use money as a way to love people. When unity of heart and soul is the root, the sharing of our possessions is the fruit. Over the years, I've heard these principles. They were pretty, pretty effective. Listen to this. What you have is not really yours. Because in Psalm 24, 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And this is right, because I have rights, but also in addition to rights, I have responsibilities. See, if God is your master, that means that I'm only the manager. And if I'm the servant, then God is the sovereign. Who are you going to go obey? Your own mind? It was funny. Last week, or a couple weeks ago, I told people, you know, you can afford to smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, but you don't give the church a dime. And somebody came up to me afterwards and they said, but I only have enough money for one more pack of cigarettes. <laughs> I guess they missed my point, like completely. If this is a temple, why would you be smoking in the first place? And you don't have a dime for the church, but you got five or eight bucks for your next pack of cigarettes. But that's all I have. That's the priority. The other thing is this. Do what you can with what you have. You see, in this early testament, first church of Jerusalem, these men and women were mobilized for ministry because they were living on mission. This was their mission. They understood that no one could do everything, but everyone must do something. Amen. I'm reminded of Acts 11:29. It says, "Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea." See, you don't have to give everything. That's not what the scripture tells us. You don't have to give so you're sleeping on the sidewalk. That's not what this Scripture tells us. It says each can do something according to his ability. They determined to send relief to the brethren and help other people. See, in America, America says you need bigger, better, greater. America has turned us into just a world of consumers. But in God's economy, we're not supposed to be consumers in God's economy, we're called to be contributors. We're called to be givers. How can we give my time, my talent, my resources? We're not just supposed to be consumers alone. We're supposed to be contributors. So how are you doing with what you have? See, your responsibility is always tied to your ability. In 1 Corinthians 3, 5, we read this. As the Lord has assigned to each his task. See, there's an assigned task that God has given to each of us. It's our job to be faithful to what he has given us to do based on the time and talent and treasures we have. Jesus wants us to be free from the love of possessions and firm in our love of his people. We win when we're all in. That's what I started with this, this message with. My friend Jan, my friend Dwayne, they're in heaven. They're enjoying the, the, the benefits of their faithfulness. You know, Dwayne was just one of those kind of guys. You couldn't stop Dwayne. It was funny. In the middle of COVID, I told Dwayne, I've been to Kroger. I've been to Meyer, I've been to Sam's Club. I've been to... Um, Costco, I've been everywhere. I can't find toilet paper or paper towels for the church. I mean, for some reason, people were like 
buying them up and they just had none and the supply chain was all messed up. So, you know, there just were, the, the, the shelves were bare every place. Well, my friend Dwayne, he figured out that there was some, somewhere. A couple hours later, he pulls up. He's got a case of 48 rolls of toilet paper and another big box of, I have no idea how many rolls of paper towel. And he said, you can't find it. I did. Here you go. Bless you, brother. That's the kind of guy he was. Just always blessing. Always um, always on, on point. It was funny. One morning, I came to church. Our church was flooded. The hot water tank blew up during the night. And we had water every place. And it was still running. It was all over. I turned the water off. and So I called up Dwayne and I told him, Man, I don't know what it's going to take to fix this water tank. I don't even know if we have enough money in the church account to fix this water tank. Um, I said, but I got a flood on my hands. I got to deal with that first. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I said, I'll talk to you later. So I hung up. About two hours later, I hear a knock on the door. It's this guy from some plumbing place. This guy, Dwayne, paid for me to come here and replace your water tank. I said, well, what do you mean? It's like, you know, how'd you know my water tank? No, he said, I'm here to replace your water tank. It's like, huh? And he's like, yeah, this guy, Dwayne, he called my office and paid for me to replace and fix your water tank. It's all taken care of. I'm just here to see what I need. I'm going to go get a new tank and I'm, I'm going to install it. No charge to you. And, you know, that's how the body of Christ should operate. They see a need. They realize that the need is great, and they just do it. You don't have to beg. You don't have to ask. I didn't ask Dwayne for anything. And then the knock on the door, he recognized the need. He recognized the need that we didn't have toilet paper or paper towels. Couldn't find them anywhere. And he just took care of it. Amen. That's the rare guy. You know, the average guy has no clue. That includes me, so I'm not preaching just to you guys. So don't think I'm beating you up. But Jesus wants us to be free of our possessions, firm in our love for people. We win when everybody's in. First, we exhibit oneness. Second, we extend ourselves. Then there's one more part to this. Third, we're to encourage others. Encouragement is an amazing word. Actually, if you looked at the root of that word, from where it came from, there's the word courage, and then you add E-N to it, which means to add courage. See, when we encourage somebody, we add courage to their life. The Bible not only gives us exhortations to obey, to obey but also gives us examples to emulate. You know, if you want to emulate somebody, emulate somebody like my friend Dwayne. Always the peacemaker, always the giver, always doing something for somebody else. Amongst the thousands of believers in this new church, the first church of Jerusalem, there's a guy named Joe. Average Joe. Or just Joe. He stands out because of how he intentionally encouraged others. So drop down to verse 36 in this text. It says, Thus Joseph who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. Average Joe. His given name was Joe, but those who knew him best called him Barnabas. Because his nickname means encouragement. To be the son of someone meant that you took on those characteristics of the one that you were the son to. As if encouragement was his father and he was the encouraging offspring. See, that word encouragement is a word which is paraclete, which is often used of the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. It literally means to come alongside, to put courage into something or into someone or walk alongside and add courage to them, as I just said. How do we add courage or put courage into someone? Through comfort, through consolation. The word is used often 
exhorting somebody, encouraging someone. Not everybody can be like Peter or John, but we can all be a Barnabas. We can all be encouragers. We can all encourage other people. See, some people are just jerks. They're just negative all the time. We're not called to be negative. We're called to be encouragers. If you're a Christian, you have hope. And if you have hope, you need to be an encourager. You need to be positive. It was funny because I used to, for 10 years, I went down to the Detroit Rescue Mission on 3rd. Every single week, I would minister down at the Detroit Rescue Mission. And I would take my time and pray for everybody that wanted prayer afterwards. And, you know, a couple guys, they're used to saying, you keep telling us we're in a good spot. I don't see it. I said, well, when you're at the very bottom, there's only one way to go, and that's up. Amen. So you're in a great place. Look up. Amen. You have a roof over your head. You're fed. It's not as bad as you think. Amen. You need to get your life together. Whatever got you here, don't keep doing that because it'll keep you here. Amen. Take this and use this as a springboard to something better. You're in a great place. The people over here at the Detroit Rescue Mission care about you and love you. Maybe not as much as they should, but they do. There's a roof over your head. You know, interesting, when we think about Barnabas, that's all he did was encourage. His name is used 25 times in the book of Acts. Let's look briefly at seven just scripture snapshots to get a composite picture of this man's character in the hopes that we can become more like Barnabas. The first one, because believers in the early church faced pervasive persecution, they didn't have a lot of money. In response to this need, we read this in Acts 4.37, that Barnabas, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So we know that Barnabas, not only was he an encourager, he encouraged with his substance. He sold a field, and he took the money, and he brought it, and he gave it to the apostles so they could distribute it to those in need. Interestingly, though, as a Levite, Barnabas would not have been allowed to own any property in Israel. We see this from Numbers 18.20. But he did have some real estate on this luxuri luxuri luxurious island of Cyprus. All right, don't laugh. Say that fast four times and, you know, we'll get, we'll get there. Perhaps this was a piece of property that he inherited. Who knows how he got this property? But this, this luxurious island of Cyprus, he owned this piece of property. And even though his home was hundreds of miles away, he made himself... One with the Jerusalem church. He sold what he had and he put the money at the apostles' feet. So, are you known as a giver or a getter? Do you just want to get what you can? Or are you a giver? Are you a lover or are you a looter? You know, it's funny. I, I still can't stop thinking about this lady from our Christmas party across the street. You know, she brought her kids and all the kids. We had over 300 underprivileged kids come to our Christmas party. And so the next day she calls the church and she said, Man, you had a lot of nice presents over at, at the Owen Jack Center. She said, I know there's some that are left over. And I said, Did your kids all get a nice presents? Oh, yeah, my kids got several nice presents. But she said, I know you got some left over and I want to come over there and scoop up the rest. It's like, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, you were blessed. You got, you didn't have presents for your kids. We gave your kids presents. And now the next day you're calling up thinking, I can score more. and I want to come and scoop up everything else they have. So are you a lover or a looter? You know, just trying to scoop up everything you can. Don't care about anybody else. Don't care. You know, we have this problem constantly at our food pantry. People see a pallet of food and they think, well, I'm going to take as much as I can get. You know, I know the sign says one, but I need six because I want six. But if you take six, that means the other 200 people behind you won't get some. Just because it seems like there's a lot, that 
the only reason there's a restriction is we want to bless as many as we can. So if the sign says one, and that means the same thing for the people that come on Sunday, the signs still apply to you because sometimes the people that come to church are the worst ones. They don't, oh, I didn't know you could only take one. The sign's been there for a month or six months or six years or whatever, you know. It's either you're ignorant or you choose not to read or you're just a looter. You want to loot the church and steal from the church because if the sign says one and you take six, you're a thief. Because we said you can have one. We didn't say you can have ten. And, um, you know, people have the wrong idea. Well, I have other people that have needs. Well, then they should come to church and get their own. I mean, that's what it's for. So, well, we'll get off of that rant. Um, are you a giver or a getter? Are you a lover or a looter? Now, look at another thing about Barnabas. Turn to Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. Here we read what happened after Saul's conversion. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of of Jesus. See, Paul was a Christian killer and a Christian torturer, a Christian persecutor. So the apostles initially didn't want nothing to do with the apostle Paul. But it was Barnabas who had empathy for this Paul, this guy who had this miraculous vision on the Damascus road. He knew that he was converted. He knew that uh, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He knew that he had seen the Lord. And he knew that he boldly preached the word of God. So Barnabas took him by the arm and said, this is the guy. And this is the guy in Acts that spoke boldly, the Apostle Paul. Barnabas took the time to stand with Paul and to speak for Paul when the others wouldn't listen to Paul. So are you known as somebody who comes alongside the underdog? Or do you don't care about the underdog? Do you speak for those who can't speak for themselves? You know, this past week, I had a meeting with the Right to Life of Michigan. You know, in, in Michigan, the pre-born, the unborn, the most dangerous place for a child to be is in the womb of their mother. You know, will you stand up and speak for the pre-born? I mean, they're human lives. Do you accept outsiders? You know, I mean, even in our church here, I let everybody come here unless they're a real problem. But, you know, a lot of churches, it's just us four and no more. We don't want those outsiders. You know, we don't want the monkey. It's going to take them time to get used to your smell. <laughs> so are you willing to believe in and befriend new believers who want to walk the walk and talk the talk? The question is, I mean, who will you come alongside this week and bless? You know, it doesn't have to be formal. You know, my heart is warmed by Art, one of the founding pastors of this church. Art was one of three pastors who founded Harvest Time Christian Fellowship, this church. And Art never preached a message in this church, but he was a pastor. Art played the keyboard. He was masterful on the keyboard. But after Art died and it was time for his funeral, so many people came and said, you know, Art helped me with my rent every single month. There was a, a veteran right here in Centerline. <laughs> and he didn't even come to our church. And this guy, he called up the church and he said, every single month Art helped me pay the rent because I didn't have enough money to pay the rent. I'm a... Vietnam veteran, and you have no idea the difference that art made in my life. I mean, art never even told anybody about the things he did. He just quietly went alongside many people and blessed them. Art was just an amazing guy. And, you know, I asked art one time, because art was in the 70s, 
And I said, when are you going to retire? You know, you're working two jobs. And Art said, I can't retire. He said, because if I retire, I won't be able to do the things that I do for the kingdom. He said, so I'm going to work till the day the Lord calls me home. You know, a couple years back, Art was shoveling snow and he went inside, sat in his rocking chair and still had his cell phone in his hand. And he had a heart attack and passed away quietly. What a man of God. Just coming alongside people that needed something. It was funny because Art was an elder of the church and when they brought me in, there was a guy that was coming to our church and I was helping that guy. And then that guy, same guy was, Art was helping that guy also. So we were both helping the same guy. So one day Art said, you know, I'm meeting somebody up here at the church. And I said, well, that's funny because I'm meeting somebody up here at the church. And then we realized this guy's double dipping both of us. <laughs> he's got two pastors from the same church that he's asking for help from. But, you know, the question is, you know, what are you going to do this week to help somebody, to bless somebody? Will you pour courage into someone else? Will you pour hope or help into somebody else's life? Or are you just going to stand on the sidelines and tear somebody else down? You know, it's easy to tear people up. You know, I've never understood this for my whole life, and it happens in my own family. And it's, it's driven me crazy since I was like about a five or six-year-old kid. How does knocking somebody else down build you up? And that happens everywhere. And it is so stupid. How is beating somebody else down going to bless them or bless you? Stop it. If that's your habit or that's your pattern, stop it. You will never build yourself up in the Lord by tearing somebody else down. The third thing that uh, Barnabas did is he was grace-based. In Acts 11, we read about the explosive growth in the church at Antioch, recognizing that these new believers needed to be mentioned, and needed to be mentored, rather, and, and discipled. You know, and so they sent the son of encouragement. Who? They sent Barnabas to Antioch. It was a distance of 300 miles. Back then, they didn't have planes, trains, and automobiles. So, I mean, when they sent them 300 miles, that means they either had a very friendly, helpful donkey, or you had your feet. Glory to God. But when Barnabas arrived 300 miles later, verse 23 tells us what he looked for. It says, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Amen. Glory to Jesus. This is a problem in the church today. We don't have steadfast purpose. We're on fire today and we flame out tomorrow. You know, we're going we're gonna to start the world on fire for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. And then two weeks later, you never see him again. We don't have steadfast purpose. We have to remain faithful. You know, I tell people all the time, some people think just because I have gray hair, I'm ready to retire. Pastor, when are you going to retire? I said, I'm not going to rust out. I'm going to wear out for Jesus. Amen. So if you're tired of looking at me until I get worn out, until my body's stone cold dead, don't expect me to retire. We have to have steadfast purpose. See, Barnabas saw evidence of God's grace everywhere. And because of that, his heart was glad. This gladness led him to encourage and exhort those new believers to keep going with the Lord, keep walking with the Lord. Grace leads to gladness, and then gladness leads to growth. And that's what Barnabas did when he went to Antioch. Barnabas never got over God's grace in his life. He never got over God's grace in his own life. And he had a radar to spot God's grace in other people's lives. He was even able to celebrate grace, even when he looked at the church and said, this is the imperfect church. He could still see God's grace. Do you love people who give grace? That's so much better than being those around who blast people for their imperfections. 
Look what it says. Look what Jesus' brother James says in James 2.13. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. So, are you an encourager or are you a discourager? Are you a grace giver or are you a fault finder? Do you see the speck in your brother's eye and you have a plank in your own eye? When people see you coming, do they take cover or do they come close to you because you have the life-giving gospel of Jesus in you? Lord God. See, some of us, Lord God. we're so negative, people run from us. They avoid us. They put their head down when they see us. They walk away from us. They don't want to, we don't want anything to do with us. Another thing that Barnabas did, he was faithful. In Acts 11.24, tells us the key to the character of Barnabas. It says, For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. God and was a great to me today. Man. He's calling me to speak to the people. Sorry to cut you off, Pastor, but God is calling me to speak, and he's coming back soon, and I am filled with the Holy Ghost, and God loves me. God loves your people. He's not playing no more games with the church. He wants to save every person in this room. By his Holy Ghost fire, he's coming upon me to come upon you. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Speak through me, Lord. May you speak through my tongue. And only you speak through my tongue, Lord. The devil is a liar in Jesus' name, and he will be condemned to hell. And you will fall forever. Mm -hmm. God wants to save every soul in this building. If you don't feel the Holy Ghost, you feel it now. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. In Jesus' name, I pray all of you people will receive the Holy Ghost and feel the fire that I feel inside of my heart right now. Because he made me stand, and I will not sit down. Ever. For the devil again. He wants to keep me quiet. He wants to keep me in that bed depressed and sad. He wants to keep me in that anxiety. That stress. I seen you the other day, brother. Thank God you made it here, brother. Yes. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Glory be to the Lord. We must sing holy, holy, holy before we go to heaven. How are we going to sing holy, holy, holy in heaven if we cannot do it now? Amen. Glory be to God. Sorry to cut you off, Pastor. But That's okay. Lord Thank you for your enthusiasm. Lord speaking. It's the Lord speaking. Amen. It's had nothing to do with me. Glory to Jesus. Amen. Glory to Amen. Jesus. He loves you all. I love you all. Black, white, orange. I don't care what color you are. It's about the heart inside. Amen. I shared love to you the other day, brother. You're black. I love you. Okay? This is Jesus Christ living through me, man. Jesus Christ. Amen, brother. Glory to God. Continue to preach. Back to Barnabas here. See, our goodness can only come out of God's grace because it's the fruit of God's Spirit that's working in our lives. It was Barnabas' great commitment to the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, as our brother just said here. Barnabas obviously took the time every day to cultivate his relationship with God. And as a result, he was directed by God's Holy Spirit. He was known as a man of faith. He was known as the good guy. And in summary... Barnabas was the real deal. Glory to God. And as a result, many people were added to the Lord's ministry. Many people were saved. <clears throat> and it's the way you live that can bring others to life. Amen. The way you live. Don't put people off. Also, he was a team player. I'm going to try to bring this together here. But Barnabas was a team player. He knew that one of his secrets of a fruitful life was to play on a team. The team of Jesus Christ. Barnabas encouraged the people at Antioch, but he also knew that he needed help himself. Look at what it says in Acts 11, verses 25 and 26. It says, So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met together with the church, and they taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were the first place they were called Christians. See, Barnabas left Antioch on a mission to find Paul. And so if he could minister, not solo, but as a team, he realized together they were better. Perhaps he knew that Paul was the better teacher and that the church needed some significant training. So he sought out another teacher. This also shows the humility because <coughs> Barnabas realized he couldn't do it on his own. He wanted a better teacher. So... He, he sought out Paul. Their names are used together, but Paul is forever listed first, meaning having more authority, more power. So the question with this is, a team player, do you have the, uh, the 
ability to admit humility when you need to bring other people along. Another thing he did was he was a forgiver of the fallen. Working as a team is not always easy. Paul Barnabas and a young man named John Mark ministered together previously in Acts 13, verse 13, but then Mark bailed on them and he went back to Jerusalem. When Paul prepared to take another missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take Mark along. But Paul didn't think very highly of Mark because Mark had abandoned them previously and refused to have him as part of the team. But then in Acts 15.39, it says this regarding Paul and Barnabas. There arose a sharp disagreement, so they separated from each other. Barnabas then took Mark and went in one direction, then Paul settled on Silas and went a different route. See, don't miss the significance of this. Barnabas was willing to have conflict with Paul, the superior, in order to forgive and restore a, a, a fallen brother. Paul had labeled Mark a loser, but Barnabas was a lover. He never gave up on him. The only label that Barnabas put on Mark was this, you matter to God, and therefore you matter to me. <laughs> we know from Scripture that because Barnabas poured encouragement encourage into Mark, this discouraged and defeated man became one of the greatest contributing members of the team once again. Paul eventually declared that Mark mattered to his own ministry. Listen to Paul's words in 2 Timothy 4.11, penned right before he died. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Amen. See, brothers and sisters, is there something or someone that you've written off? Have you labeled somebody a loser? It's time to give grace and stop gossiping, stop backstabbing. Who will you reach out to this week and restore? The last thing that I want to say about Barnabas is this. He knew his flaws, his fatal flaws. I love how scripture is so real when it comes to human character. Even the heroes of the faith have fatal flaws. We don't have time to fully develop this whole thing, but Barnabas was called out by Paul for hypocrisy. Evidently, at one point in time, Barnabas was a people pleaser and he was afraid of conflict. And we see this in Galatians 2.13, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. You see, if we, if we look at this model of Barnabas and pour courage into others, we will win when we're all in. Amen. And here's some other questions to ponder before I close. When can you reach out to somebody this week to develop or exhibit oneness and bring them back to the fold? Today, reach out to your brother and sister right next to you. The second question is, how can you extend yourself by giving some of your possessions to help another person in great need. And the third question is this. Who will you encourage this week? Who will you add courage to? To help them along. They might need that courage. Let us pray. Gracious Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the blessings. I pray, Lord, that as we leave and depart this place, that your word wouldn't depart from us. That your word would be written on the tablets of our hearts. It would be written into our minds that this word would dwell in us, that the divine download that we've received today would be powerful and effective, that it would stay with us until we act it out. How can we exhibit oneness? How can we extend ourselves to each other by sharing our possessions with someone in need? And who can you encourage this week? Lord, I pray that they find that one. Bless them to find one. Let them do something, Lord. We're to be doers of the word, not just hearers only. I thank you, Lord. Make us doers of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.